Hello everyone, welcome to your 17th C++ Cute Game tutorial. So we're going to go ahead and start a new game that was suggested by these two guys, Splooge McDuck and Fier Palantin. Um, so this guy suggested that I make a hex-based board game, and then he gave a little more details on the rules uh, of the game. Uh, and it's very similar to this Final Fantasy minigame called Triple Triad. So uh, thanks to these guys for the suggestion. Now the first thing that I do when I have a new project in mind is I start with a blank sheet of paper. Normally um, I work by hand on this paper, so I use a paper and a pencil. Um, but I can't do that on my computer, so I have to type for you guys. But I would highly recommend that you start with an actual paper that you can draw on, because that is very important. It's difficult for me to draw on a computer, but I'll try. Okay, anyways, now on this blank sheet of paper, paper you just want to plan. You want to think about what is the purpose of your project, um, how you might do some of the things, and just kind of make an architecture or a, or a list the classes that you might need and, and the function names. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that for our hex-based board game. The first thing you want to do is write a description of the project. So in this case, uh, since it's a game, clearly we want to write how it's played. So let's go ahead and quickly write about the gameplay of the hex-based board game. Now, we will have two players um, alternatively taking turns placing hexes onto the board. So we have two players that take turns uh, to place hexes on the board. When a hex is placed, oh, and before I mention this, I should mention that uh, each side of a hex, a hex is a hexagon, it has six sides, each side of it has its own attack value. So when a hex is placed, we want to compare it to all of its neighbors. Um, and if, well, more specifically, we want to compare adjacent touching sides. So if an enemy and a friendly hex touch, we want to look at the side that they touch and compare the values of those sides. Whoever has the higher value will conquer the other, meaning that the other hex will be owned by the player of the attacking hex, okay? So when a hex is placed, compare its side to all of its neighbors. If its attack value is greater, then conquer the neighbor. Okay, um, as you can see, you don't have to be precise. You don't have to worry about using correct spelling or, or grammar or anything like that because this is for you. It's just a design for you. Um, Anyways, um, and then at the end of the, uh, the game, basically we're going to count all of the hexes and the player that has more hexes will win. So when the hex board is full, count the number of hexes. So we don't want to, that's too much detail. When the hex board is full, announce the winner, the player with more hexes on the board. Okay. So the next thing that I normally do is I write down what classes I may need. The first class that comes to my mind is, um, let me go ahead and scroll down a little bit. Okay, there we go. The first class that we clearly need is something to represent a hex. So the hex class will represent, represents a hex. And uh, let's see what attributes this may need. Um, clearly, it will need uh, an owner. We need to know who owns this hex. Um, also, some attributes describing the attack value of each of its side. I'm going to represent each side as a number from 0 to 5. So we're going to have side 0 attack, uh, side 1 attack, side 2 attack, all the way down to side five attack. And uh, okay, so that looks good enough for the attributes of the hex. Now obviously it's gonna need some methods and this is gonna be its uh, basically, uh, we'll, we'll get there um, later. Anyway, so let's give it some methods. Um, we're gonna clearly need a get owner method. And I'll explain at the end why I'm using these getters and setters rather than just accessing the attribute directly. Or said in another way, why I'm using getters and setters 
rather than making the attributes public. Generally, making internal attributes public is a bad idea, but I'll explain that later. I have a little uh, summary up above. So uh, we're going to need get owner, and then we also need access to the attack value. So we're going to make a member function called get attack of, and that's going to take an integer and it will return the attack of that side. So if I do get attack of zero, it's gonna return the side zero attack, etc. Okay, so we're done with the hex class. Now the next class that we're gonna need is a hex board. This will represent a hex board that is responsible for manipulating hexes. So you can think of this, think of this as a container or hexes. Okay, so what attributes might this class need? Um, it will need a list of hexes, clearly. We're gonna need the capability to add hexes to this list and remove hexes to this list. Um, will it need anything else? Nope. For now, that's it. Okay, so what methods might this class need? We're going to need access to this list of hexes. So this will return a reference to this list. Um, and then I also want a little helper function called place hexes. And this will basically populate the hex board. It will actually place the hexes onto the scene and it will add them to the list of hexes. Okay. Um, now we're done with the hex board class. Uh, now, we've always seen this pattern of needing a class to manage the game as a whole. This is no exception. So let's go ahead and have a game class. And, um, oh, and I forgot to write, uh, basically I want to write down what these inherit from. I, I like to have that information in my plan. So the hex will inherit for, inherits from Q graphics polygon item because a hex is a polygon, and if we want to place a polygon onto the scene, which we do, then it has to inherit from two graphics polygon item. So that makes sense. The hex board, we're not going to have it inherit from anything because it's simply a container. And then the game class, we're going to have it inherit, uh, inherits, excuse my spelling, um, inherits <laughs> um, from Q graphics view. Okay. And it will be responsible for managing the global aspects of the game. So things like whose turn it is and um, basically just the high level uh, managerial stuff. Okay, so what attributes might this game class need? We're going to need a pointer to the scene because we're going to have to manipulate the scene a lot by adding hexes, etc. And then we're going to need a pointer to the hex board. We're going to have to manipulate the hex board. Also, we're going to need a variable that says whose turn it is because it's a turn-based game. Okay. And uh, for now, that looks like pretty complete. But again, this is a plan. We may change this. It's not static. It's dynamic. Okay. Let's see what methods our game class might need. Um, so we'll go ahead and give it a start method. And this will actually start the game. I want to put this in the method rather than a constructor because it's bad behavior or rather bad um, habit to put too much unnecessary code into a constructor. So I'm going to have a start game and this will basically start the game by generating a hex board and then, you know, like placing the hexes, etc. All of that code I'm going to put in this start member function. Okay, so let's see how long I've been recording because I want to make this, these tutorials a little bit shorter. Eight minutes. Okay, so my goal is to keep them under 10 minutes and definitely never over 15 minutes because I know that they got a little too long. So nine minutes, um, I still have one minute, so I'll keep on going. Um, okay. Well, actually, I'll go ahead and summarize what we have learned so far. Uh, so basically, we're doing this plan, but why are we doing this plan? Um, it's because we want to have a good balance between planning and coding. Why is that? Well, in general, the more you plan, the more time you'll save coding. Uh, basically, your, your project, what I'm trying to say is, if you spend a sufficient amount of time planning, then the total amount of time to finish your project will be significantly less. But there is such a thing as over planning. 
So you could just get bogged down way too much on the little details. And in that case, um, you're just never going to even get started with the coding. So you definitely need to have a good balance between doing the right amount of planning and coding. Now, too little planning is bad and too much planning is bad. Um, but I think most people have the problem of doing too little planning. Your plan shouldn't take longer than a few minutes anyways. As you can see, I'm doing it pretty fast. And then the second point is have a good balance between thinking whether you uh, whether what you want to do is possible or having faith that it is possible. I've noticed uh, this being an important point. So for example, when I'm making these classes and I say things such as represents a hex board that is responsible for manipulating hexes. Now quickly when I write this in my head, I think about how I might allow it to carry out its responsibility, such as, oh, it will need a list of hexes and then it will need to manipulate these hexes by getters and or um, such as uh, like adding to the hexes and then adding it to the scene. So basically, um, you don't want to think, you want to think a little bit about how you might implement the things that you want to do, but you don't want to think too much about it. You want to have, uh, you want to continue to look at your plan from a high level. You don't want to get too bogged down on the details, but you want to quickly go in over your head to make sure that what you write is possible, because if it's not possible, um, you're going to have to change your plan. Um, I would say it's more important to just have faith. Um, have faith that what you write down, what you want to do is possible if you do the right amount of research. And that's usually the case. But it helps if you can quickly think if what you want to do is possible or if it's kind of easy. You know, if it's too hard and possible, you might not want to do it. All right, in all of this, I know that this is very vague and you're like, okay, how do I know what's a good balance? And the only answer to that is experience. I'm sure you're used to hearing this, but you probably hear it so much because it's true. Um, everything gets easier as you gain experience, especially with programming. So this intuitive feeling of what's a good balance between planning and coding and, and having faith that what you want is possible rather than uh, thinking about it. Well, all of this is gained through experience. So you want to practice designing as well as programming as much as possible, not just programming. Don't always jump into the code. Try to do a quick little plan of what you're going to do what you're going to code and then go ahead and program it. The more you design and the more you program, the better you become at it. That's a pretty obvious one. Uh, and that's really the only way you learn this, how to balance these things, which is critical for bigger projects. Now, one other thing is um, you notice that I have a lot of getters and setters. That relates to the concept of encapsulation. Encapsulation is basically refers to the fact that classes want to hide their internal information. They only want to reveal information that is important to the outside world or useful to the outside world. And this is accomplished by making um, certain uh, attributes uh, and methods private, meaning that the class believes that these are not important for the outside world to see. So um, basically, if you practice encapsulation, meaning that you use getters and setters rather than making attributes public, this will give your class a more clean interface. Uh, for your client code. So you, this makes your class easier to use. It gives it a cleaner and simpler interface because you explicitly specify what's public and then you hide everything else. Okay, so that's it for the uh, first tutorial. I also wanted to mention one ending note and that is um, I have been getting lots of feedback and I really appreciate it. So thank you very much for that. Um, please continue to give feedback, uh, especially if you haven't. Uh, let me know uh, what you like, what you dislike, if I'm going too fast, if I'm going too slow, or even if you want me to cover a certain topic that I have not covered yet. I definitely read the comments and I take them into con uh, consideration uh, as to what tutorial I'm going to make next, how fast I'm going to go through it, and, and basically everything like that. So thank you for watching and we're going to pick up right where we left off um, in the next tutorial. I'll see you in the next tutorial. Bye-bye.